Wow, thank you, Debbie and Connor and Riley. That is awesome that they would start out in the nursery and end up on the platform, you know? Isn't it? That is cool. That is truly homegrown. Thank you so much. Do you, I believe, I believe with all of my heart that God has spoken to us through his words. Do you believe that with me this morning? I also believe that God continues today to speak to us. Do you believe that? Do you want to hear a word from God this morning? Okay, then let's bow our heads and would you pray with me for a moment. You pray with me this prayer. Holy Father, I want to hear a word from you this morning. Open my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you. Open your Bibles, Genesis, chapter 44, verses 3 through 16. The narrator of Genesis, and narrator has a capital N, has been oh so careful in developing this story of Joseph. We're coming to the climax of the first book in the Bible. We're almost there. We'll actually reach the climax next Sunday. But we're very close to the mountaintop of Genesis at this point. So we're in lofty places. And it, uh, we, we come to the approach now of the main event. And so all hearts must be ready at this point. But they're not. And God is working in the hearts of the players to get them ready for the thing that he wants to do. The very same thing that he is doing in our hearts, uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord, he is getting us ready for the main event. The main event for us is the day that we will stand in the presence of God Almighty. And everything that is happening in our lives, everything that is happening in your life right now, whether we can realize it or not at this point, is getting you ready, is getting us ready to stand in the presence of Almighty God. Now, in Genesis chapter 44, verse 3, it says this, As morning dawned, the men were sent on their way with their donkeys. The men here are 11 brothers. They are the sons of Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, the great patriarch of faith, who lived some 2,000 years before Jesus was born of a virgin in Bethlehem. They lived close to that very same place in Canaan. But they live at a time when there's a horrible famine. There's food in Egypt, and so this is the second time that they've had to go down to Egypt to buy food for their family. Things have not gone well. There have been some strange problems that they haven't understood. They don't realize yet, but God is at work in their lives, getting them ready for what it is that he wants to do. But everything right now seems to be going well for them. They have the foods, uh, and they're on their way back home. Verse 4, they had not gone far from the city when Joseph said to his steward, Go after those men at once, and when you catch up with them, say to them, Why have you repaid good with evil? Isn't this the cup my master drinks from and also uses for divination? This is a wicked thing that you've done. Now, Joseph, too, is a great-grandson of Abraham. In fact, he's the twelfth brother. And they don't know it because they don't recognize him. His eleven brothers haven't seen him for some twenty years two years 22 years before this 10 of those brothers out of uh out of jealousy and hatred for joseph kidnapped him and sold him into slavery and he spent 13 years in slavery and in prison but god miraculously lifted joseph up and he now has this position of authority and power in egypt where he is the one in charge of selling food to all the world and so the brothers have come to him not realizing that it's their brother, Joseph, thinking that he has been dead for many, many years. And so Joseph has good reason to be angry, to resent his brothers, to be bitter about what they have done to him. And he knows that he'll find this cup that he's talking about here in the sack of one of his brothers because he is the one who planted that cup in that sack for this very reason. Divination. This is something done in the ancient Near Eastern world where they would take a cup or a bowl and they would put, in some instances, water and oil in and watch the patterns that formed and, and try to interpret those patterns and 
presume to predict the future. It's something that's outlawed later in the law. Why is Joseph even involved loosely with something like this? The text never says directly that he did it. He claims to do it. He has the cup for it. And besides all of that, why is Joseph coming up with these trumped-up charges? Why is he lying? Why is he manipulating his brothers? We can understand why he would resent them, why he would be angry with them and bitter over all that they did to him some 20-plus years before. But does that give him the right? Does that give him the right to bring these trumped-up charges against his brother? Well, let's see what happens. Verse 6, when he, the steward, caught up with them, the 11 brothers, he repeated these words, Joseph's words, to them. But they said to him, why does my Lord say such things? Far be it from your servants to do anything like that. We even brought back to you from the land of Canaan the silver we found inside the mouths of our sacks. So why would we steal silver or gold from your master's house? Now what they're talking about is that Joseph was messing with them the first time they came. He put their money back in their sacks and they didn't realize it until they'd gotten home and, and they thought that uh, it was uh, a ruse to have them arrested the next time they came down. And so this cat and mouse game has been going on for a while between Joseph and his brothers. But they brought the money back and they're saying, here, why would we steal a cup? We brought all that money back. If we wanted to steal something, we would have just kept the money. Verse 9, if any of your servants the brothers say to the steward, is found to have it, he will die. And the rest of us will become my Lord's slaves. Now, they're very confident here that they don't have this cup. In fact, they're too confident. And they overstate the case. And they're in dangerous territory because they've just offered up their very lives for their innocence. But notice that they assume a collective guilt or innocence. They are willing to stand or fall together as brothers verse 10 very well then the steward said let it be as you say whoever is found to have it will become my slave the rest of you will be free from blame now he agrees but did you notice he actually changed the conditions of the agreement uh, he said no I agree with you that somebody needs to pay but we're not going to do it the way you said whoever has the cup he will become a slave he won't die the rest of you will be free to go. Now the steward apparently knows what Joseph's trying to do and he realizes that uh, what they said won't work. That it's necessary for Joseph's plan that only one brother be found guilty, the rest be free because he's going to pit those brothers against the one, the same way that those brothers were pitted against him years ago. Verse 11, each of them quickly lowered this sack to the ground and opened it. Then the steward proceeded to search, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. He's the youngest. At this, they tore their clothes. Then they all loaded their donkeys and returned to the city. Tearing the clothes in the ancient Near East was a sign of mourning or distress. They cannot believe what has just happened. Because the youngest brother, they had to talk their father into letting him even come. Joseph made it a requirement that they, come, that they bring that brother if they ever come back for food, knowing that they would have to. And here he is, caught with this cup. Who knows what's going to happen next? But they go back with him. They could have left him at this point and said, well, we did everything we could, and Benjamin stole the cup. Uh, we'll just have to go back and tell Dad that we tried to protect him, but for some foolish reason he stole the cup, and we had to leave him in Egypt, but they don't do that. They're beginning to show some maturity. They go back with Benjamin. Think about what that ride must have been like for them riding back into the city, wondering what is going to happen next. Surely it was a very quiet ride. It's doubtful that anybody said very much. Their thoughts must have been going a million miles an hour. Verse 14, Joseph was still in the house when Judah and his brothers came back. Sure he was. He knew there was no reason to go to work that day because he had already planned all of this. He knew that very soon his 11 brothers were going to be coming back with the steward because all of this is part of of his doing. He's the one that's manipulating all of this. Joseph was still in the house when Judah and his brothers came in. Notice Judah is mentioned here. He's about to take center stage. And they threw themselves to the ground before him. Once again, here they are, the 11 brothers, on the ground, bowing to the brother Joseph. This is where it all started, 22 years older, when Joseph was 17 years old. God gave him a dream. And in that dream, his brothers bowed before him. And here it is, again, being fulfilled. 
But there was another dream where both the brothers and the parents bowed. That one hasn't been fulfilled yet. And Joseph knows this isn't over. Verse 15, Joseph said to them, What is this you've done? Don't you know that a man like me can find things out by divination? Joseph is usually presented in a positive light in the book of Genesis. When he's a teenager, he's a little bit pretentious, but very soon he becomes very wise for his age. He, he, um, he's a man of, that's chaste, he's a man that's wise, he's a man that's patient. But in this particular event, it seems as if Joseph is wrestling with himself. And he does some things that aren't exactly honest. He's lying. He's manipulating to find out whether his brothers have grown, to find out if in the two decades since they sold him into slavery, have they changed? Or would they still sell him today? He's going to put things together in such a way that they are tempted to sell Benjamin, his, his brother, and find out if they would sell him the way that they did him, the way that they did Joseph. Verse 16. Now Judah takes center stage. What can we say to my Lord? Judah replied. What can we say? He repeats himself. We, we get the, the feeling here that he's, he's just completely undone. He can't believe what has happened. What Joseph has done is put them on an emotional roller coaster. The night before, he brought them to his house. He gave them a feast. They drank together. They had a great time. Simeon was brought out, who Joseph had, left, had kept in prison when they went home and had to come back. Benjamin was safe. They had their food. They had everything that they wanted. Everything seemed to be going so well. And then Joseph pulls the rug out from underneath them. And, and Judah here just can't seem to think straight. What can we say to my Lord, Judah replied. What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? He knows they're innocent. He knows they're innocent of taking this cup. Apparently, they know that Benjamin didn't take the cup. But the cup is not the issue. Look what happens next. God, look at these words that Judah says to Joseph. God has uncovered your servant's guilt. God has uncovered your servant's guilt. We are now, my Lord's slaves. We ourselves and the one who was found to have the cup. Judah takes the lead. Judah's the one who was promised, who promised Jacob their dad, I will take care of Benjamin. If anything happens to him, then my life for his, basically is what he had said. And now here things are going bad. And Judah steps up, uh, and he takes the lead. And, uh, and, but what is he doing? Really, what is he doing here? I, I, I mean, these men need to get food back to their families. That's the whole issue here. There's a famine, and their families back home are going to starve if he can't get that food back to their family. That, what, nothing else matters, right? It's all about the food. What in the world is he doing? Why isn't he defending himself? Why is he giving up? He didn't take the cup. Let, write down a couple of things real quick on your bulletin on the back sides. Pen or pencil? Judah needs food for his family. Why isn't he defending himself? Judah needs food for his family. Why isn't he defending himself? Well, the answer is right there in verse 16. When Judah says, God has uncovered your servant's event, your servant's guilt, he is saying that he sees the hand of God working in these circumstances. He's not talking about the silver cup anymore. The first time that they went and things began to get rough, they didn't realize, obviously, that Joseph was Joseph. They just think he's an Egyptian. They didn't know that not only was it Joseph, but Joseph could understand what they were saying. And they stood right in front of him, and they said, the reason that all these bad things are happening to us is because we sold our brother into slavery all those years ago. And now we're being called to account for that old sin. They live every single day with the guilt of what they had done to their brother. And every time something goes wrong, they interpret it as God's hand moving against them to get them to pay for what they've done. And so what Judah's talking about here when he says God has uncovered your servant's guilt is not the silver cup. He doesn't care about the silver cup. What he sees here is finally he's been backed into a corner. 
Finally, God is going to call him and his other brothers to account for what they had done to Joseph 22 years ago. 22 years, 22-year-old guilt. What about what's happening today? What about Joseph? He's not being totally honest. He's lying. He's manipulating. He's bringing trumped up charges. They're innocent of the cup. Judah is innocent of the charge. Here's the next sentence on our outline. Judah is innocent of the charge. Why is he confessing old sins? What is he doing? This is not the issue. Food, family, Canaan. Judah seems to have, have lost his mind here. Everywhere he turns, he sees the hand of God. Judah sees justice hunting them down like the hound of God. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. There's no place hide from God God has entrance into our very hearts God is like the programmer who writes software and leaves a back door open so that that programmer no matter where that software goes no matter who's using it no matter how long goes by he can always get back into that software again and change it and do what he wants to to it God has given us a heart. He put eternity in our heart. He is the maker. He is the programmer. It doesn't matter where we go, what we do, or where we are, or what has happened. God still has a back door. He has an entrance into our hearts. And at any moment, he can speak to our heart. No matter where we are or what's happening. And sometimes it can be quite shocking. God, really now? Now you're going to talk to me? Can't you see what I'm doing here? I'm busy. I'm at work. I'm trying to take care of my family. This is important. For some reason, God thinks that what he is doing is always more important than anything we might be doing at any given moment in our life. And so he opens that door when he chooses to. And Judah stands there naked before God in all of his sin, and he realizes it. God has uncovered your servant's guilt. What can I do? He's weak at the knees. There's nothing he can do. It's like a double conversation that's going on. It sounds like he's talking to Joseph, but he's really not. He's talking to God. He says, we're your slaves. We're your slaves. I had a dream this morning. It was so real. It was incredibly vivid. Now, I drove to a, a park in a bus. It was our new bus, by the way, which Tommy and I are about to go get uh, tomorrow. So Wednesday night when you show up, the bus will be here. If it's not, send a posse. But I drove up to this, this park in our bus, and I got out, and I began to walk through the park and stop and pray at different places. And I came upon this young man, very well-dressed, well-groomed, and he was sitting in a chair, and he looked very disturbed. And so I stopped, and I asked him, what's wrong? And I found out that he was uh, a member of a, uh, a, um, a legal group, works for some attorneys. And he said, I'm working for somebody who is getting ready to meet God. And he said, I've never done that before. And I could see by the look on his face that he was deeply disturbed by his assignment. And as I listened to him and we talked, a group of people gathered around us. And within moments, we were surrounded by people who were very quietly listening to the conversation. They were fascinated with what we were saying to one another. And I looked at him and I said, you know, that's amazing. Because in my job, I talk to people all the time about getting ready to see God. And he looked at me so intently in that moment right there. It was like time stopped and everyone was holding their breath, waiting to see 
what would next be said. And at that very instant, my alarm went off. It was a strange experience because it ripped me out of that moment. And I, suddenly I was in my bedroom reaching for my phone to try to turn my alarm off. And it was as if the world that I was in now was a shadow land. I was disoriented for a moment or two because the world of that vision was so real. And to come back here seemed shadowy, dusty, like it wasn't real. It took me a couple of moments to kind of get my bearings again. And as I thought about it, it reminded me of C.S. Lewis in the Shadowlands. You realize, of course, don't you, church, that we are walking through Shadowlands. This isn't our final reality. There's an eternity that's more real than we can imagine and we won't know until we actually get there. Judah was more right than he realized. God was working in his heart. It wasn't about some silver cup or a bunch of food or a famine or his family. Not that any of that stuff wasn't important. It was, but there was something far more important. He needed to get his heart right for what was just about to happen. He didn't realize it. But he needed to get his heart right so that he wouldn't be a slave for the rest of his life. For 22 years, Judah has walked around a slave to his guilt. Tried to deny it. Tried to ignore it. Tried to pretend that it didn't matter. But it did. And now he finally has to say, I'm a slave. And I'm sure it felt like at that moment that he was, but God wasn't opening his heart so that he could become a slave. God was opening his heart so that he'd become free. God, it's hard to have to admit our guilt. It's hard to have to confess our sin. It feels like we're dying when that happens, but what's really happening is God is leading us to freedom. He wants to set us free. The lion from the tribe of Judah. The lion from the tribe of Judah. Judah is starting something here that will echo down through history for hundreds of and hundreds of years, and it will culminate in a cross outside the city of Jerusalem where Jesus Christ, the lion from the tribe of Judah, would spill his blood and his body would be broken so that we can be set free forever, so that we can walk through this shadow land and know that there's a land of reality waiting for us someday. Someday we will look back on this and say, that was a murky, shadowy place that we lived in. It seemed so real when we were there, but now I know what reality truly is. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? It's the cross of Christ that sets us free. To come to the cross is to come to a place like Judah had come to that day. It's a place where first we must confess our sins. That's the first step. That's the doorway that we have to walk through. Until we do that, there is no benefit for us in the cross. Once we do that, the benefits from the cross are never ending. Have you come to the cross yet? Have you given your life to Christ Jesus? Many of you here, I believe, have. You're my brother or my sister in the Lord, and We're about to come to this table. Let me tell you that if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, but you're not a member of our church this morning, then we believe that you should share in the bread and the cup with us this morning. Because it's not church membership that matters, it's whether or not you belong to Christ. But this is a time of getting things right with God. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and will purify us from all unrighteousness. We, in that sentence, is people who are already saved. We still have to confess our sins because we still live in this shadow land full of sin. We still get dusty as we walk along the roads here in this life and we still need to cleanse ourselves. We still need to cleanse our souls. We know we can. We know how to. And in just a moment as we have an invitation, I ask you if you need to come to the altar and get on your knees, please do so. Prepare your heart. The first step in being ready to come to the table is to be a follower of Jesus Christ.
to come to the cross, to confess sin, and to ask Jesus into our hearts. Repent then and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from God. That's what the Bible says. It starts with repentance, and it ends with refreshing. Do you need that refreshing this morning? The refreshing of knowing that you're right with God, knowing that you're forgiven, knowing that that real land someday is your destination, not this shadow land. If you've never done that, I urge you this morning during the invitation to come forward, pray with me or somebody else. Repent. Turn to God. And get the refreshing that he has to offer. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you this morning that we can be ready. Not only to meet you in eternity, but we can be ready to encounter you right here in this life. We can encounter you right here and now in this hour of worship and at this table as we come before you. Now, Father, as we take a moment or two and listen for your voice, we ask, Lord, that you would break down whatever barriers there are in our hearts so that we could respond to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. You come.